Thanks, John. So, we've read those two brief psalms, and the impression you could take from them is that David is saying, yeah, I believe in God, and I'm strong in my faith, I despise people who are sinners, God is here for those who walk before him, doing nothing wrong, absolutely perfect, and then he's going to save us, because we're so good. And... The problem is, with all these people who don't believe in God, and the atheists, and the the people who slander their neighbor, the people who do evil to their neighbor, etc. And we are the righteous, and we look forward, as he says, to the salvation of Israel coming out of Zion. And on first reading, at first blush, that seems the narrative of Christianity. Unfortunately, I think that that is a a wrong reading. I think David is wrong here in this line that he comes out with. And he himself was persuaded later on that he was wrong. And unfortunately, the idea that I'm right, and the problem is with the atheists and the unbelievers and that lot, but we are the righteous who walk uprightly and who do the right thing and who despise the, the wicked and we shall be saved when the salvation of Israel comes out of Zion. This leads to an arrogance. It leads to the very reasons why a lot of people turn away from Christianity, because they say it's all full of people who are up themselves, people who are arrogant, people who are self-congratulatory, people who are meretricious and, and full of their own righteousness. And what attracts people is not someone who claims to be so perfect, but someone who is convicted of their weakness and of their sinfulness, but is confident and solidly confident in God's grace. And that's what David became in the end. Now, when you read the book of Psalms, you're reading Psalms of David, a fair number of them. I would actually argue most of them are actually his Psalms, although they were maybe rewritten by later writers. But it's hard to put them chronologically. But I think the... Psalms that he wrote before he sinned with Bathsheba are a bit like the ones we've read. Self-congratulatory, talking all the time about the wickedness of other people. And the ones he writes after that are different. Now, David sinned with Bathsheba. He was on his uh, rooftop, that flat roofs, of course, in Israel in those days, and he sees this attractive woman next door when her husband is out fighting David's battles in the army, and he takes her, he sleeps with her, then he gets her husband murdered, and, well, God judged him for that. And the punishment for uh, murder, which is what he did to her husband, was was death. There was no sacrifice to offer, Uh, he had to die. But he was saved by grace, and he comes to a, a completely different attitude after that. So let's just bear that in mind as we go through these little psalms. So Psalm 14, verse 1, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. And again, on one level, this is true. This is effectively the attitude of a lot of people. But he's not criticizing atheism. He's criticizing the person who says in his heart there is no God. And this can be all of us that effectively at times we say there is no God. It's just me and my strength. And these verses, this first couple of verses, he's saying the fool has said in his heart there's no God. They're corrupt. They've done abomination. Verse 2, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there was anyone who understood who was wise. And that word translated understood or wise is the word used about David himself when he's in the court of Saul, and we're we're told that David behaved himself very wisely, as a man of understanding. So I think what he's saying is, God, they're all rubbish, they're all basically atheists, they don't really believe, but I, 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 I am wise. But you know, these words, these two verses are quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 1, and he applies them to all of us, including David, and he actually goes on in Romans to talk about David as the great sinner, as a pattern for all of us. So the point is that we are all actually like this, and this is what David had to come to realize. And 
By the way, he says, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men, searching for anyone who is searching for God. And that, you know, on one level, that is true. And so, God is in search of man. He himself says, I have found David my servant. Jeremiah, he tells him, run around the streets and squares of Jerusalem to see if you can find a man that's looking for me, because I'm looking for him. God found Israel in the wilderness, we're told. you got the parables of the lost, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. God is searching for people. He's searching for every one of us. So if somebody says, well, I've been searching for God for years. I've spent my life searching for God. Yes, okay, fair enough. But he is in search for you. He's not playing hard to get. He's not saying, well, whoever searches for me, and if they figure out what the Bible says, well, yes, I'm waiting there for them. He's more proactive than that. He is searching for us, and everything that happens in our lives is directed by him so that we might come to him. And Paul talks about this when he talks about uh, we who know God, and then he adds as an afterthought almost, or rather are known of him. In other words, he is the one who takes the initiative. It's not that God is hiding behind the Bible. It's not that the Bible is a riddle to be solved. And that God is there for the guy who figures it all out. He wants us. He wants you. He wants me. He wants all those who he wants. And we then are to search for him, but knowing that he's searching for us. And so in those parables of the lost, where you've got, for example, the woman loses her coin, she searches until she finds it. And then she's rejoicing that she's found it. In that moment... When you find God and he finds you, there is something electric that goes on. The parable says, all the angels of heaven rejoice because we found each other. This is like the ultimately great relationship that stays together forever. That we searched for him and he searched for us and we found each other. And there is that spark there, that dynamic spark when God and man find each other. But he is in search of us. So don't think that, you know, God is somehow passive and distant. And, you know, beyond the steely silence of the skies, God is in search. God is active. He is not looking someplace else. He is not bored. He is not, well, not paying attention and just there if you happen to find him. He is searching for us and all the little irritations in life, the stuff that goes wrong, etc. This is all him working to bring us to himself. So David, however, goes on here and says, verse 3, they all gone away from God. They're filthy. None of them does good. None of them. And what he's really saying is they don't understand. They're not wise. But he was the wise one. That's the same word you see used about David. And then verse, uh, Psalm 15, verse 1, Lord, who will abide in your tabernacle and who will dwell in your holy hill, which is Zion, Jerusalem? Now the temple, or the tabernacle as it first was, was built in Jerusalem on a hill that was called Zion. And David loved that hill, and when he, was, when he became king, he decided that he would capture that hill because it was under the control of the Jebusites. These were people who were Gentiles. And he's saying here, I so want that, and who is going to be allowed into the temple, into the tabernacle, really is what he means. Verse 2, he who walks uprightly, who works righteousness, who speaks truthfully in his heart, who doesn't slander with his tongue, who does no evil to his neighbor. Verse 4, who despises a bad person. But he honours those who fear the Lord. These are the people, he says, who shall live, who shall have fellowship with God in Zion. And he's implying that the Gentiles who were there were a bad lot, are to throw them out, etc. But wait a minute. You know, as I say, on one level the narrative sort of makes sense, but when you think about it, no, because we are all sinners. And... Who can say, I walk uprightly? Verse 2. 
Well, only someone who is, I would say, rather arrogant. I walk uprightly, not like these sinners. I work righteousness. I speak the truth in my heart. Not just to speak the truth to other people, but in my heart, my self-talk is full of utter and absolute truth. I don't slander anyone, I don't do evil to my neighbour, and I despise bad people, verse 4. Well, on one level, yes, but the problem with this is that it's not realistic, because we all sin. And who can say, yep, that's me. I don't do anything wrong. The problem is them, is the other lot. They're the bad lot. And what about David himself? Verse 3, he does no evil to his neighbour. Well, David lived in Jerusalem. And from his rooftop, he looked out and saw his neighbour's wife. And he took her and slept with her and got her pregnant. And he then murdered his neighbour. Well, David, who shall have fellowship with God in his holy hill? You, David? Well, no, obviously not, my friend. And you see then how the self-righteousness of these earlier psalms changes. I'll just read a few of these psalms which say the same sort of thing. Um, Psalm 24, 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And again he's talking about Zion. He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to vanity, he shall receive blessing from the Lord. Wait a minute, David. He who has got clean hands and a pure heart. Well, that's not you, David. It's not any of us. Uh, When he sins with Bathsheba, he finally repents, and he begs God to wash him, to cleanse him from his uncleanness of his dirty hands and his impure heart. But at this stage, he says, no, only those with clean hands and a pure heart are going to ascend into the hill of Zion and have fellowship with God there. Well, he had to realize that that was not him. 26, Psalm 26, 4 to 6. He says, I have not sat with vain persons. I have hated the evildoers, I will not sit with the wicked, I wash my hands in innocency, and that is how I come to your altar. No, that is very self-righteous. Um, third, uh, sorry, 28 verse 4, he talks about the wicked, he says, give them according to their deeds, punish them according to the wicked things they have done, give them the result of the works of their hands. Well, David sinned by committing murder, of his neighbour, to take his neighbour's wife, and as he later says, there was no sacrifice under the law of Moses for that. He had to die. But he says, oh God, I know that's true, but please forgive me, I throw myself upon your grace. And God said, okay, I will accept you. But uh, not on the basis of works. If David was given according to his works, he would have had to die. Psalm 31 verse 6 I hate those who respect vanities, but I will be glad and rejoice in your in your mercy. 33 verse 22. Sorry, no, that's the wrong one. That's, yeah, sorry, no, that's the wrong one. Anyway, I think I've made my point. So going back to Psalm 15 verse 4, he talks about in whose eyes a vile person is despised. He despised sinners. At the end of the book of Job, you come to, I think, some level of spiritual maturity by all concerned. And in the old days, before we all had uh, phones and and read the Bible in electronic versions, I I would have said this, I'd say, scribble this in your margin. Job 36, verse 5. God does not despise any. He despises not any. God does not despise people. But here, even sinners, because God appreciates the meaning and the value of the human person, even if that person is a sinner. God does not despise any. Job 36, verse 5. But David says here, oh, the righteous person who doesn't do any wrong to his neighbor, who is of an upright heart and walks uprightly, he despises sinners. 
No, God despises nobody. So you see what I'm saying? That on one level the narrative here is correct. In one sense, of course, we should walk uprightly. You shouldn't walk any other way. Of course, you should not do evil to your neighbor. Absolutely. But the point is that David failed. And I think that Jesus had this in view a bit in sort of correcting David. Because look at verse 5. The righteous man does not lend his money for interest. The righteous man doesn't lend his money for interest. And David is obviously thinking about himself. I don't lend my money for interest because the law of Moses said you must not lend out your money for interest. Jesus told a parable about talents and by talents he doesn't mean abilities. He means talent in the old sense of a weight of uh, money. And in the story Jesus said that there was a man who went away and left all his servants with some money. And they all had to trade with that. And he comes back and he says to his people, right, well, um, <clears throat> how much did you gain by trading what I gave you? First guy comes and says, yeah, you gave me this money and I traded it and I got some extra. Well done, he says, you can be ruler over five cities. And next guy comes and says, yeah, I, uh, I traded what you gave me and I made more talents. Yeah, okay, you can be ruler over two cities. This is in, in the kingdom of God. And the final guy comes and says, well, you gave me your talent of silver or whatever, and I, <clears throat> I wrapped it up in a cloth, and I put it in the soil, I buried it, and I didn't spend it on myself, and I'm giving it back to you. And Jesus says, you wicked person. At first blush, you're sort of slightly taken aback by that. He says, why didn't you at least lend it out for interest, and then you could have given me the interest. Now, the parable means this, that Jesus has gone away, but he's gone to heaven. He was here on earth and went to heaven. And he's given us each something, his wealth. And we are to do something with that. And when he comes back at the day of judgment, he will want to know what we've done with what we were given. And the person who has the one talent of silver, has hidden it in the ground, and he gives it back to Jesus. And Jesus says, no, you're not going to be in my kingdom. You should at least have done something. You should have lent it out for interest. Some of the Bibles say, put it in the bank. But in those days, they didn't have banks like we have them. The idea was, lend it out for interest. That's what it meant by putting money in the bank. And Jesus was speaking to Jews. He was a Jew living amongst Jewish people. And of course, this would have stuck out like a sore thumb. This would have been uh, really noticeable. What? You're saying that a man should have broken the law? Well, yes, I think that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you should have done at least something, even if it was not ideal. And yes, you would have been breaking, if you wish, part of the law. But at least you did something. And then I would have accepted you. But you just ignored it. You ignored what I gave you. And you did nothing. At least if you'd have done at least something, even if it wasn't the ideal, and even if it broke the letter of God's law, well, I would have accepted you. Whereas here David is saying, yep, the righteous man who's going to finally go up to the hill of Zion and be accepted by God, he never lends out his money for interest. And Jesus, I think, pulls that round and says, well, yeah, sure, that's not ideal. But if you had done at least something, even if you had lent your money out for interest, which according to the law of Moses, you're not supposed to do, then I would have accepted you. But you did nothing. You made no response to my moves toward you. You made no response to what I gave you. And it's not justification by works. It's, I would rather say, response. Um, at least responding to what I have given to you. And when I talk to folks about getting baptized, giving their life to God or to Jesus, they say, ah, I don't know enough. Or they say, well, you know, my life's not perfect. Um, you know, so maybe somebody says, look, you know, I get drunk on Friday nights. I do drugs on Tuesday nights, or whatever it might be. And 
And I say, so what do you reckon then? You, you reckon you're going to get to a point where you're uh, perfect and you're going to come to Jesus and say, yeah, I'm perfect now, I'm good enough for you. No. In that case, you'd have missed the point. Missed the point completely. Jesus is a doctor and he came for the sick, not for those who think that they are without need of a doctor. And so he is willing to accept a lower level. That's what he means when he says to the man who's rejected, look, you should have at least have given out my, my money to the bank. You should have lent it out on interest. And as I say, David is here younger, I think, when he's writing these psalms. And <clears throat> after his sin with Bathsheba, I think then he is really convicted of really what is the grace of God and what is the essence of relationship with God. And Paul quotes this uh, in, in Romans, and he sets David up as our pattern. And I would like to quote from uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 4, where all through Romans, Paul is, or Romans 1 to 8, Paul is talking about justification with God by grace, by faith, and not by works. And he says, Romans 4 verse 4, To him who works, the reward would not be a matter of grace, but of God's debt. But to him who does not do works, but just believes on the God who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Just like David describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now he's quoting here. This is Romans 4, 7 and 8. He's quoting here from David's words after he sinned with Bathsheba and he's been forgiven. But actually he slightly changes the quotation because he's quoting there from uh, Psalm 32, and when David says that he personally has had his sins forgiven and his sins are covered. But it's, quote, it's changed here, blessed are they. Whereas David says, blessed is the man, and he means me, whose sin has been forgiven and covered. But it's changed here, blessed are they. In other words, David, in that conversion that he went through, is a representative of all of us. And so you can be a believer in God, like David was, from his youth. But you can come to a point where you are converted to a higher level. And you can have several of those conversions, reconversions. And that's what happened, I think, with Peter. Jesus said to Peter, when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. Well, he could have said, but Lord, I'm already converted. I'm already a convert. I'm a believer. And yet, Jesus says, when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. So there are stages, if you like, levels of conversion. And we all hear because we believe. We are not unbelievers. But I suggest that there are other steps to go. There are steps up the ladder, if, if you wish. And <clears throat> David went through this, Peter went through this, and David here, according to what Paul says, is set up as our pattern. And I think we all start out in our Christian walk with this uh, simplistic idea that David had when he wrote these psalms. It's all true as far as it goes. He doesn't say anything that is, is untrue, but there's a lot more to it. That, yep, the righteous hate the uh, wicked and they despise uh, sinners and they walk uprightly and they long for the salvation of Israel to come out of Zion like we long for Jesus to come back etc and you know it's as simple as that but with more experience of life of your own failures and those of others you come to realize that that narrative is incomplete and the point is that we are to be convicted of our own personal sinfulness and this is what will give you that humility that is so critical. It's that which makes you helpful and attractive to other people in that you are admitting that you are saved by grace and not because you ticked all of God's boxes. You, you didn't. And 
yet with that humility, there is, yeah, it's not the humility that says, oh, I'm a hopeless case, I'm a bad person, I'm no good. No. It, it's the humility that is mixed with a confidence that I know him and I know whom I have believed. And we should be able to say that if Jesus comes back right now, by God's grace, I will be in his kingdom. And I have this wonderful hope of everlasting life in front of me. But we say that with the humility that must come from recognizing that I have not lived perfectly. And it is all by grace, and this should not be the case for me, but it is, by God's grace. And as I say, it is that humility mixed with this confidence in God's grace and God's salvation, which, if it's seen in the very texture of, of a, a human being's uh, life and personality and so on, it's this which enables us to witness to other people persuasively and to be of some good in this world. It's no good if we're all negative about ourselves, oh, I'm a hopeless case, I don't know, I'm not going to be saved. Well, what good is that? Neither is the arrogance, really, of folks like David in his youth, that I walk uprightly, I despise sinners, I am right before God, I am the one who understands, who is wise, when oh, all the rest of them are, are fools, they say in their heart there's no God. Well, that also is not helpful to other people, because who is going to be persuaded by you if that's how you are? So, I don't mean to come over as critical of David. Um, I'm saying that he was on a path to maturity, which in his case involved committing murder, which in his case involved adultery, um, and all the associated lies, dishonesty, machinations, etc., which go with those things. And maybe in less dramatic ways, but nonetheless, we are also on that same path. And God wants us in his kingdom. Remember what we said to start with, that God is in search of man. That God is not passive. That he earnestly wants us to be saved. And so we come closer now to the, uh, to the bread and wine and to the thought of Jesus on the cross. And of course we, we wonder why this had to be the case. Why there had to be the cross. Why he had to die. Could God not have arranged human salvation in some other way? Well, sure, he could have done. But God is not limited. Um, God does not need to see red liquid, blood of, of his son. He's not a pagan uh, deity who needs to see blood before he can do anything. Not at all. Why then? Well, of course, it's multifactorial why Jesus had to die on the cross. But I think one of the reasons was to grab our attention to grab our attention and say, look, I am serious about saving you. I am desperate, this is God saying this, I am desperate to save you and to make you see that I am not passive, that I am not a God afar off, that I really do want you, that I do want to save you. So as I say, God is not uh, hiding from us. It, maybe how it seems, but that is not how it is. And God is not leaving us with the Bible as a riddle to be solved. And if you manage to solve it, then, okay, I'm on. I, I'm with you. I'm here I am. I reveal myself. He's not playing hide and seek. He is in search for us. And he wants us. And of course, in one sense, all you've got to do is say yes. In the end. Because it is of grace and not by works. But by continuing to say yes to him, then this takes a huge grip upon your life. That if I know that I am going to live forever by his grace, that changes everything. Absolutely, radically changes everything. Every part of your life is impacted by that. So, let's break bread, which is to commemorate, which is to celebrate all these things. What he has done for us. And I'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, from 23 to 29. I received of the Lord Jesus that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup and he'd eaten, saying, This cup is the New Testament, the New Covenant. This is God testifying. This is God promising. This is God testifying to us. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. So, when you take this cup, this is God testifying. This is God speaking to you. This is God saying, I am serious. I want to save you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come, because the Lord's death was this New Testament. It was this testament from God, this legal, if you like, testimony of God saying, I swear that I want to save you. Wherefore, whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, who can despise the testimony of God himself. Let a man examine himself, and so, that is in that mindset of self-examination, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So, let's give thanks for the, uh, for the bread. <laughs> Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread, in which we see the symbol of your Son's body. That was given for us, and we thank you that we can take a part in it. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless each of us here, that we will be parts of his body, and that as his body suffered and yet rose again in glory, so we also, each of us here, will rise again to resurrection when he comes again. Please, Father, bless us then in our journey, in our desire to be identified with him and with you. For his sake. Amen. After they had eaten, Jesus took the cup. As I say, this is the cup of the New Testament, as Paul says. This is God's testament to us. That I want to save you that much. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we accept this cup as your testament to us, as your statement to us, that you desperately want to save us. Father, it is difficult for us to believe because we are so weak, have such a low view of ourselves, and we pray, Father, that in your grace you will forgive us and that you will bring us at last into your kingdom. For Jesus' sake. Amen.